We have an opportunity here to bring presence to the ceremony that is your life. And my invitation to you is to stop whatever you're doing, wherever you are, just for this one precious moment and take a deep breath. Follow the breath into your root point and land yourself right here, right now, into your present moment. And exhale. Welcome to the space where all the magic is happening and prepare yourself to receive the wild, raw expanse that is available inside the dojo that is your life. You are the empowered center point creator of every single experience that you are drawing into your field at this time. When you recognize that and really get that in your bones, you will receive yourself as the magnet for the most perfectly expansive evolutionary curriculum that is precisely crafted for you to evolve beyond what was in order to claim all that is a match to the you who is free. And that is what we are here to do inside the dojo as we explore what it means to live a life beyond the edge. This is a Soul Fire production. Welcome to all of the available ears in the dojo family that are present here in this moment. I'm here with one of my best friends on the planet and one of the women that I respect most on the planet, Dr. Kat Meyer. And I'm so excited to introduce all of you to her. And before I do, I just want to presence the prayerful space that we dropped into before turning on this recording. That prayerful space is an essential ingredient when it comes to the listening that I am asking for from you when you receive every episode, every journey that is the dojo, life beyond the edge. So I want to invite you to slow down in this moment, even if that means becoming present to the deepest breath that is available, just creating the space for that, for you to bring all of your presence and your awareness and your most valuable resource, which is your attention, into the leading edge, most alive pulse of the moment that you are in. I just came out of a week of grandmother ceremonies in Costa Rica. And during that week, I received a massive reset when it comes to this podcast. This podcast doesn't even feel quite right. I'm still figuring out how to name what this is. The best that I can name it so far is that it's a digital, audible transmission that has packed within it the energy of liberation that you get to take a dose of every time you tune in to this journey that we're sharing here. And so Kat and I, Dr. Kat and I, have both gotten very clear (laughs) about our whys for offering up this this transmission to you, why we're here and, and how it is that we are intending to serve up our expanse and the energy of liberation that we've experienced in our own lives beyond living beyond our edges and how that has occurred in our reality. And our prayer is that that becomes an invitation, a space for you to explore the expanse that is available beyond the leading edge in your own life. So there's a lot of territory that I feel excited to cover with Dr. (laughs) Kat today. Um, This woman, oh my goodness, we've been walking in each other's lives for over eight years now. Yeah, I think it's been over eight years. And from the very beginning, we've had a really beautiful alchemy of sisterhood and service, sisterhood and service together. Mm -hmm. We started doing retreats together, I think within a year of knowing each other (laughs) and, um, the sisterhood that we share, um, just like the invitation within dojo 
containers is that it transcends really any container. It transcends any frame, really. Like that's one of the essences of our sisterhood, I feel, is that all the deaths and rebirths that we've been through, all of the different kind of like groups of friends that we've journeyed through, our, the, the different ways that we've served, the sisterhood we share, just it like engulfs all of it. Mm. It's available throughout. And so, um, yeah, that's one essence that I really want to explore with you today is like, you know, the, the energy of sisterhood and of belonging mm. and of inclusion mm. and, and, and that across the board, especially when it comes to sexuality. Yeah. And, you know, I know that's such an area of expertise for you. That's my why. That's your that's why. My why. Yeah, yeah. So I'd love for you to share, like, before mm. we really get into it, what is your why for, for being yeah. here today? Yeah. yeah. My why, why do I do this work? <sighs> so to give everybody a bit of context, I'm a psychotherapist. I'm a licensed psychotherapist and I specialize in relationships mm -hmm. and sexuality, mm -hmm. trauma, and ketamine-assisted therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yummy. So yummy, yummy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so my why comes down to mm, bringing people into connection with their bodies and with mm -hmm. their sexuality, really mm -hmm. changing the relationship, evolving that relationship yeah. with sex and their bodies, mm -hmm. and accessing this very mm, deep, primal life force energy mm -hmm. that exists in the sexuality mm -hmm. and allowing that to really permeate the rest of their life mm. because I believe when you are able to access that everything just because you, you mm. access your power you mm. access your life you access mm. pleasure you yeah. access yeah yeah just this greater Mm, yeah, I, I keep coming back to the word power, but there yeah. is this power, you know, yeah. where so many things cause us to feel disempowered or take our power away. And yeah. yeah. Mm. So. so if you were in this moment, I'm curious mm. to illuminate the way for those who are listening that may be um, just exploring their the power that's rooted in their sexual expression mm. for the first time. Right. So, um, and, and whether actually I would say whether those who are listening or accessing this for the first time or have been doing it for a while, one thing I know about Dr. Kat is that she has, we, we teach what we've walked, right? Mm -hmm. Like we can invite others to expand into the capacity with which we're actually holding. Mm -hmm. And one thing I know about this woman is that her capacity to hold when it comes to human sexuality and accessing more of yourself beyond your edges in that that way is enormous. It's enormous. Mm. And so this is a safe space. If you choose to receive it in that way for you to slow down, like we said in the beginning of the episode into finding your present moment through your breath and actually receive the transmission that Dr. Kat can offer in this moment. And throughout this episode for you to find your threshold point in your familiar zone with how you normally relate to your sexual energy and see if you can find that edge and pop beyond it. And so Kat, as a starting point, mm. if you were to invite those who are receiving this transmission at this time, as a starting point, whether, the, whether you're a seasoned vet like Kat, right? <laughs> but, the, but we get to trust the container that she has, right? Whether we've been in this work for a minute, like I've been exploring my sexuality for a minute, but the capacity Kat has to hold for me is, is beyond <laughs> where I've gone. Right. So for, for the vets and also for those who are just like tapping on the door of, okay, the power of my sexual energy, could you guide us into, um, whether it's through a vision or a breath or how, whatever feels true for you to access the root point, like the beginning of, oh, that's where my sexual energy lives. Oh, there's the power underneath it. Like if I were to drop into just becoming, getting into relationship with my own sexual energy, mm. could you point us there? So first, uh, before I do any of that, I mm -hmm. always bring in the invitation around sensuality first. Yeah. Because not everybody's ready to access their sexuality mm -hmm. because of our relationship around sexuality. Yeah. And so if we first define the difference between those two, because yeah. especially in our world and especially because of marketing, <laughs> yeah. you see these two terms interchange so often mm -hmm. and sexuality has, comes with it so many 
past traumas, experiences, messages, expectations. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. so, but I find that sensuality can be more readily accessible. So sensuality is the platonic relationship with our body. Mm-hmm. It's the experience of pleasure of the world mm-hmm. through our five senses. Mm. And mm-hmm. sexuality mm-hmm. is more of the relationship to our primal energy mm-hmm. that you are referencing. Yeah. You know, this buzz and tingle mm-hmm. in the body that gets us in like, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, she just brought me there. So <laughs> yeah. we're just going to activate each other a little bit. So <laughs> it's more of that primal energy. Mm-hmm. Sexuality is also how we identify ourselves in the world. So that's mm-hmm. our attractions, our desires, our uh, pleasure, our orgasms. Mm-hmm. And they can exist both together and separately. And that's really important for us to identify because sometimes we think, okay, sensuality, if we intermix that and we're like, oh, well, I'm not going to be sensual because I, you know, I, I feel nervous and feel hesitant. I'm like, ah, what is that? What's this feeling? But then I would say, no, let, what type of tea do you pick in the morning or what clothes do you put on or do you like candles mm. in your house and like mm. this mm. is the pleasure of the world through mm-hmm. our five senses mm-hmm. and i think that's really important for all of us to mm. be able to to cultivate yeah you know it's sensuality uh can help us to access our body especially if our body hasn't been a safe place for us to to be in for a myriad of reasons mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And sensuality, when it is paired in sexuality, brings the juice Mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. whether it's a solo experience of connecting with that primal energy or if it's a partnered experience, you know, we, we taste the salt of their skin on the mm-hmm. tongue, or we smell the way that mm. the florals of their hair, or we look at them and then, yeah, I know, I haven't gotten yeah. everybody, <laughs> have got new access to it yet? I'm <laughs> salivating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And sexuality can also exist in sensuality. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes you know, when we're eating chocolate and we just like moan because it's mm. so good. And then we start feeling our body start to tingle because mm-hmm. we're just so connected with the pleasure. And then all of a sudden a tingliness starts yeah. to come up. And so for some of us who don't have a healthy relationship or mm-hmm. ha- still are having challenges around our relationship to sexuality, that tingliness yeah. might be, uh, we might, might bring up panic. Mm. You know, we might not feel comfortable in that and we mm-hmm. might want to shut down. Mm-hmm. And so for anybody who's on this journey, mm-hmm. you know, I would suggest first starting with that relationship with sensuality, yeah. you know, and b- even before that, yeah. beginning with the breath, yeah. because if you can regulate, mm-hmm. downregulate your nervous system, yeah. create a sense of safety in your body first, yeah. then you can access sensuality mm-hmm. so much more easily mm-hmm. and, or, you can also use sensuality as a way to to connect with the body. So, yeah. so I see sensuality as both, eh, you know, like there's the paradox of you can't yeah. access sensuality until you feel safe, but you can also use sensuality to get into your body and, yeah. and, and work it the other way. Mm, I love that. So, so mm-hmm. starting there, but then also if you feel the flutters, you're not ready for that. Place your hand on your heart and breathe into your heart space. Mm-hmm. And that can help to just... Uh, down regulate yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a great resource yeah. of hand to heart breathing. Yeah. Um, bring your nervous system back into a regulated state and mm-hmm. also n- uh, observe that that's your edge. Yeah. That's your edge. You don't have to be, move beyond that. Just mm-hmm. be with it, notice it, and then yeah, regulate again. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that yeah. pathway. So sensuality can be the gateway drug (laughs) for the beginning of a deep and healthy relationship with sexual energy. And so what I'd love to do is actually invite everyone who's receiving us in this moment to like place your hands on your heart, you know, as Dr. Kat invited, and let's all allow our nervous system to downregulate together and open up to the sensual awareness. What I noticed in your sharing was through just bringing the superpower of my awareness to the current sensual experience that I'm having, which is feeling through the edges of my skin, the temperature in the room. It's feeling the way the breath 
is experienced on the back of my throat. It feels cool. Literally and feels of, cool in the, the pleasure. pleasure of it. Yeah. yeah. The and pleasure that's of the that. Key. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And otherwise appreciating it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Otherwise it's just data points that mm-hmm. your sensory neurons are picking up. Yeah. But it's the pleasure of it mm-hmm. that helps your body to expand. Yes. Yeah. So let's go there. Let's go there here. So feeling the pleasure of the, the, the temperature of the air on the back of your throat. If your heart is beating faster, right? As we start to really drop into the body, you know, as Kat said, placing one hand on your heart and breathing, taking a deep breath into the heart space and perhaps using hands on your body to feel the way that the pressure on your legs is being experienced and find the pleasure in your own touch on the body. Mm -hmm. And we get to open up our receptors to the sensual experience that we get to have together here today and trust that through an open heart, an open mind and an open body, which is always available through a deeper sensual access, right? The sense, the senses are the way that our spirit is experiencing the, the openness of the moment. So can we access a deeper availability to the fullness that's here in the moment through our senses? That is a pleasure practice. Mm -hmm. That is the beginning of a pleasure practice. And you can do that in your every now moment. Can you imagine what you're evoking in me? It's evocative. Mm. It's evocative. (laughs) Yeah, you are evocative. Yes, I know. I know. This is what she does to me. (laughs) So like when when you're with someone who is actually in their body, and present to the aliveness of the moment through their senses, it be, you become an evocative space. Can you can you feel that? So you in this moment get to through this practice become an evocative space, and then carry that with you out into your day, which is you are a woman or a man who is online, present, and available through the senses to this moment. Now, becoming evocative means also in this in this way that you are available to yourself fully yeah. Yeah. which means you're feeling yourself you're feeling yourself mm-hmm. you know what i mean and sometimes hopefully most of the time that feels really fucking great and also we're human we're having a human experience which means that often we have obstruction we have trauma we have nervous system activation that can be very uncomfortable to experience being a spirit, an infinite soul channeling through a finite physical form that has experienced trauma points throughout this lifetime that in many instances, we didn't yet have the tools to know how to navigate. So it can be uncomfortable. There's a reason why we dissociate and aren't always inhabiting our bodies fully. So through this practice with the intention of pleasure, it's possible that you might touch some pain points as you come deeper into the body and become more available to yourself. So I'd love to go there with you, Kat, and and share a little bit of a a story because you're one of the people I've come to the most in the moments when I have been the most in it. So I want to paint that picture. (laughs) Your pleasure. (laughs) It's true because I trust, I trust you. Mm. I trust you in this way. And I want to, um, you know, I, I imagine just through the law of synchronicity, a lot of the women and men that are listening to this, this journey, this podcast, it's, you know, I'm working on that language, but whatever this, this, this expression, this transmission is, will also have moments where they're touching up against their, their own edges that are, have been no go zones in the past, these trauma zones that we develop identities and protections so that we don't have to experience, even if that means not coming fully into the body, but this is this journey, this, the dojo is about living your life beyond those edges. It's about having the courage and developing and cultivating the tools to meet those pain points that used to be no go zones, but perhaps as of today, become the zone that you're ready to expand beyond, that you're actually ready to touch that part of yourself that you had previously deemed untouchable. So 
with you, Kat, the, the, um, I think the last major process that I went through where I was leaving my almost four year relationship with my partner, Oren, who's an incredible man that I thought I'd be with for the rest of my life. And it got to a point where the karmic contract romantically had expired. And I, the prior reference points that I had for feeling that level of heartbreak, or perhaps a level of heartbreak that I had never experienced before, the memory of those past reference points told me that I didn't know how to handle it. My, they told me that the, the memory that I had was that I, it would take me out of the game. And I had a lot of fear around letting go of that relationship. I didn't know who I was without it. I didn't know if I would be okay without it. It was bringing up a lot of past trauma that was unprocessed. And it was being paired with leaving our home in LA, leaving the home we had been in, really essentially leaving my community here, uh, uh, releasing everything in my known reality. I spoke to that in episode um, one as well around the journey that I've been on. So if you want to hear deeper about that journey, you can check that episode out. But for now, when, when I was actually in the heat of that moment of release, of truly letting go of everything in my known universe, where what it felt like to me was it felt like I was going to drown. It felt like, <sighs> like my system I didn't have a touch point or nowhere to go. So I was actually completely dysregulated in my nervous system. And we called, I called Kat, right? So Kat came over and I'd love for you to share about nervous system regulation and how those who might be listening, if you're facing off with a major transition or a, a loss of a love or a relationship or, or grief, when that trauma point, you start to see that it's nearby and perhaps it's a threshold that you've never crossed before. Yeah. Are there any like tips that you could offer or invitations for, for nervous system regulation, for facing off with trauma and edges in that way and expanding beyond them through the body? Ooh, yeah. Well, that's going to be <laughs> how many episodes we got. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we're here. If we have to do part two, we'll do part two. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's back up and talk about the nervous system. Cause a lot of us might've heard in, you know, high school about the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system. So it's a little more complex than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so on a regular day basis, our nervous system is picking up cues in the environment and it's labeling it as dangerous, mm -hmm. threat, stress, mm -hmm. or safe. Yeah. And we call this communication with the environment mm -hmm. neuroception mm -hmm. with the environment and with inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the nervous system is picking up these, these things, um, identifying them, and then that impacts the way that we move through the world. You know, our bodies contract and they expand according to what it's picking up in the environment. Mm -hmm. Now, we can tolerate about so much, mm -hmm. and then we have a threshold of what we can tolerate. Yeah, got it. And so the daily stressors that we have, or if we look at uh, during the pandemic, there was much more stimuli in the in the environment the political system the mm -hmm. the riots the um uh, just being in our homes alone by ourselves over and over and not having as much touch yeah. you know all of these are picked up by the nervous system and saying these are threat or stress mm -hmm. and so that what we could tolerate gets smaller and smaller mm -hmm. that window of tolerance gets shorter mm -hmm. and so then we become a lot more sensitive yeah. to cues and we can't hold as much mm -hmm. so especially um uh, those who have a menstruation cycle, mm -hmm. um, shortly before your menstruation, that window of tolerance will get shorter and shorter just by the nature of our hormones. Definitely. And so, <laughs> you know, the, that, uh, we are a lot more sensitive to mm -hmm. things in our environment. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with mm -hmm. us. We're not crazy. We're not broken. <laughs> is that why my boyfriend is currently tracking my menstrual cycle? He's like, baby, it's about in five days or so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yes, good yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so that's just mm -hmm telling us that the body actually needs more to stay yeah. regulated. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to take care of ourselves a lot more. Otherwise that window of tolerance just gets smaller and smaller and yeah. smaller. And we snap that snap is us hitting the threshold of what we can tolerate. Mm -hmm. And we kick into the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. That's the sympathetic part of our nervous system. And this mm -hmm. is, um, hyper aroused. So this is where we're more, 
um, crunchy. We're like, yeah. we might have chattery brain. We might have a difficult time with, with thinking very clearly. Mm-hmm. Things race. Mm-hmm. Uh, we might yell. We might, and we might have a meltdown. We might yeah. uh, throw something across the room or we might just see red and see, right? Yeah. So that's that state. And then there's a threshold of that. And once we kick that, then we kick into hypo aroused, which is the freeze state. Yeah. The freeze, the collapse, the disassociation, disconnection, foggy brain, mm. exhaustion. Mm-hmm. We might start getting uh, some of my clients when they hit that, uh, their trauma, we're working on their trauma, all of, all of a sudden they start getting sleepy. So their eyes start drooping yeah. and they can't keep their eyes open. Yeah. So this is the body shutting down. Mm-hmm. And so all of these are very beneficial for us to be able to have. Mm-hmm. Of course, we need the energy to run mm-hmm. away or fight. But if we don't have, if we can't run away or fight, then we go into play dead, mm-hmm. possum. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we disconnect. We, yeah. We're not there. Right. And so all of this is adaptive. Mm-hmm. We end up, the issue there is that when we don't understand that this is a natural response and this is all working for us, mm-hmm. We end up shaming our body for having these natural responses. Mm. And then we clench to Mm. prevent it from happening. And when we experience a distressing event, if the body's not able to complete the fighting or the running away, and it goes into that free state, then that's what trauma is. Mm. It's not the event it's how the body responds mm-hmm. and how the body can't complete mm-hmm. the body and the brain can't complete mm-hmm. what it needs to, mm-hmm. to survive. Mm-hmm. So wow. that's, that's huge. Yeah. So it suspends yeah. our, um, there's a whole process of like the, you know, the, um, hemispheres of the brain and, and the prefrontal cortex and the, um, uh, amygdala, which is like your memory center, your emotional center, mm-hmm. uh, strike a discord. So mm-hmm. things don't process as well as they yeah. are right now. Yeah. Right. Wow. It's, it's really interesting to hear you speak of that. Cause what it, it reminds me that it's easy to get hyper-focused on the story. Yeah. It's easy to get hyper-focused on the story of what happened and continue to retell yourself that in order to justify why you can or cannot do something. And so what you're sharing with me actually helps to create some space Mm -hmm. around that it's not so much around the story, which is the catalyst. And I really Um, stand for empowering ourselves as creators, that we are not victims. And so I recognize in my own journey, anything that created a really strong trauma point in my past history story with my, with my, whether it's with my family of origin or in past relationships, I recognize in my belief system structure affirms that it is a part of my soul curriculum. It has been a part of my soul curriculum to attract that exact experience that was the perfect experience to bring up inside of me what I needed to feel so that I could find the liberation that's on the other side of that healing, which looks different for everyone, right? And and so that's why I've been able to recognize patterns of occurrence in my own life that fit into a particular category and recognize, oh, that makes sense. That's a part of my soul curriculum that I am attracting again an experience that has a similar texture of a past experience. And so I actually start to get excited and say, oh, that makes sense that I'm experiencing a catalyst that's bringing up this familiar feeling in me that I get to work with and and bring into the light of my awareness and transmute through the light of my love, finding how to, it's always about finding love more love in the places that we have deemed unlovable. And so these old past traumas points, these stories by actually looking at creating a little bit of space and saying, it's less about the story, but it is that then it is about seeing how the experience of that circumstance or that situation was digested or not through my physical body. And that, which is not digested the trauma point or um, metabolized, however you want to process it, let, letting the energy all the way process through. Cause we didn't have the, if you didn't have the tools to process it through at that time, whatever is not fully processed through then becomes the trauma point that we then carry and create and recreate experiences of whether it's avoiding it or, um, actually going into the healing around it. So I think that's important to note that it's actually less about the, what happened and more about how much of the, the impact of what happened processed through the body in a way that's 
healthy or he like fully, fully complete. Yeah. It, and I think it's really important to also emphasize that stories are just a one resource. Yeah. 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 That, um, learning about the having compassion or reaching compassion, which is a whole process in and of itself of yeah. around how your body operates and how it's always trying to take care of you is yeah. important. Yeah. Um, so we oftentimes default to the mind mm -hmm. to process things. That's yeah. like, we think that that's going to be the quickest yeah. way and we yeah. talk about it and everything. Yeah. Um, but it's actually quicker to process through the body and mm. with the body. So somatically. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot yeah. more um, therapists. We're seeing a lot more theories coming out that's incorporating more somatic work. Yeah. And so that's getting the body to complete some of these processes that got interrupted yeah. at the time. And so mm -hmm. the um, in teaching the body, some of that is um, the process of shivering. Mm. So shivering is a natural mm -hmm. process we're all supposed to go through to be able to downregulate the nervous system and return back to that window of tolerance. Yeah. But for so many of us, we don't like that loss of control in the body. And so we clench and that inhibits, that's already impacting the body's being able to complete what it needs to. Mm. Shivering flushes out the stress hormones in your body from mm. that fight or flight response. Wow. That somatic, yeah, mm -hmm. the sympathetic system. So we need to be able to shake and shiver and dance and move the body so it breaks up mm -hmm. not only the, um, well, it flushes out the stress hormones, but it also breaks the armor that we've created because we keep clenching. Mm -hmm. How many of us mm -hmm. growing up, and I'll tie this back into sexuality of like, mm -hmm. as children, we run around, we we, we scream, we, we pull hair, we, mm -hmm. you know, knock things over. And then we're told, stop that, sit still, yeah. stop. And every time we were told, stop, sit still, we, we it, 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 clinch. Wow. We're like, huh. And yeah. so that is already inhibiting or don't touch that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all of that is already creating armor in the body. Mm -hmm. And so now we've been trained to clench and hold and contract. Mm. And that creates more rigidity. Mm -hmm. And that reduces the flow of the energy yeah. in the body. Mm -hmm. It also causes more of a uh, self-consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, and not in the way that is compassionate, but in a way that is to avoid criticism. Yeah, it's right? like control. And, right, mm -hmm. to avoid punishment, to avoid mm -hmm. criticism. Mm -hmm. So we, we um, hold tight. Mm -hmm. Instead of being able to flow and move authentically like we're designed yeah. to, so that energy can can uh, move us, mm, mm. you know, instead of us mm -hmm. keeping it mm -hmm. keeping it contained. So this, I mean, it flashed through my mind your undone experience. Yeah. So you know, um, I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. But you know, the timing, I think, of 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 having the awareness to recognize when strong, what I call curriculum, is up for you. And there's either, you know, a huge transition or relational material or, um, money material, um, shifts in, in, in purpose or, um, fears, doubts, lacks that are coming up through different catalysts in your life to, to have the, um, space in situational awareness to recognize, okay, there's a catalyst present in my field. And I would love for all of you receiving this to actually presence whether there's a catalyst or a trigger that's present in your field right now that seems to be activating a trauma response in your body, right? Like if as a pattern where you're either clenching up or freezing or wanting to run away, going into a flight or fight response and just presence that right now. And I think a huge key is having the awareness around timing and saying, oh, there's strong material that's up for me right now. And it's activating this fight or flight or this trauma response in my system. And so when that's present and you have the awareness around it, you become the creator and you can start to employ some of what Kat is sharing to support your nervous system in your body in completing, letting the energy complete itself through you. So one way to do that is by attending experiences like the one Kat facilitates called Undone. And I'd love for you to, to share a little bit about what that is so people can track it and find it. But there's a lot of different ways that you can actually empower yourself to be conscious and active in, in moving through these trauma responses. So love to hear about it. Yeah. So it actually started with me and my co-host, Lena Ozea, who's a phenomenal singer, songwriter, DJ. Yeah. We both 
had challenging relationships with our bodies as so many of us do, right? And how do we, how do we be in this body safely? And so yoga was a powerful catalyst for me to mm-hmm. be able to just find safety in my body mm-hmm. and the experience of not being so anxious and so um, heavy with emotion and sadness, unprocessed, yeah. and everything. Yeah. Uh, so yoga helped me to open the body and feel calm and downregulate. And so here Undone is about undoing these negative messages around what it means to be a sensual a uh, woman, femme, uh, non-binary mm-hmm. as well, uh, and undo these negative messages around what it means to be in this body. Mm. So we incorporate practices of yoga, mm-hmm. ecstatic dance, mm-hmm. and breath work mm-hmm. as ways to open the body, yeah. to to unlock the body. Mm-hmm. And then to release yeah. from the body. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we do all this practice in our underwear <laughs> because it's all about testing mm-hmm. those edges yeah. of, you know, in these classes, women mm-hmm. cry in the middle of the mm-hmm. yoga because they, they are meeting up against these parts of themselves and they're having all these messages coming up around, I'm too fat. I'm not enough. I'm, mm-hmm. you know, this, that, or the other. My buddy, you know, uh, had some women who had had, um, C-sections and so seeing their scars right in front of them as they're moving and as they're yeah. bending in, in bizarre poses you know yeah. and they're fully with their body you yeah. can't escape it and so mm-hmm. emotions come up mm-hmm. and then you're held in this container of compassion and allowance mm-hmm. and and meeting all of that and, and it being okay that yeah. all of that is there. You don't have to be more evolved. You don't have to not ever have challenges or, mm-hmm. or not be kind to your body. Mm-hmm. It's, it's okay. It's mm-hmm. all a part of the human experience. Mm-hmm. And we're not seeking perfection. We're just seeking a relationship with our bodies yeah. and getting to know her on the more intimate level. Mm-hmm. So we've evolved this into retreats and mm-hmm. the retreats are amazing you know yeah. and and because i'm moving with a tra- with a trauma informed blends it's it's building that slowly mm-hmm. you know and and that's important for everybody to know because i think there is such mm-hmm. an emphasis on um these these really complex mm-hmm. ideologies around well you uh, self love mm-hmm. self love love your body you know mm-hmm. majority of us can't even access that yeah that's so complex how do you do that how is that accessible mm-hmm. so it's breaking that down and using the word titrate titrate mm-hmm. means adding a little bit at a time mm-hmm. you know and so we start with just meeting our body yeah. we start with talking about um sensuality and body acceptance first Mm -hmm. even before we get to the sexuality Mm -hmm. and so i think that's important for everybody to to really let sink in is that what you're he he reading on memes or what you're listening to on social media Mm -hmm. you know if you're finding yourself getting frustrated with reading these self-love or or body love messages like you're not alone Mm -hmm. (laughs) like we really do need to break these things down for us Mm -hmm. and so that so that um we don't hit the shame spiral of well i suck because i can't self-love myself yet yeah yeah Yeah. it's a fucking process (laughs) don't try to go there yet it's like it's that's a far-reaching state yeah the integrity of that is really really powerful yeah. that you're bringing like making it okay to not be okay yeah. as a first step yeah like that feels central and that's it's beautiful mm-hmm. and and the so i follow more traditional tantric um practices around this and uh, mm-hmm. the, the emphasis around this is an entire human condition and the mm-hmm. entire human condition is beautiful yeah there's romance even in the criticism, there's mm-hmm. romance, even in those times where, where we're just like a mush puddle on the ground with like mascara across our face yeah. and like, oh, it's so beautiful. Mm. There's something so exquisite about the breakdowns. Yeah. And I agree. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it, it, it's just, and even those times where we're shaming ourselves, there's something beautiful about it mm. because even that part that shames us, there's mm-hmm. something about uh, something in that part of us that believes that that's the solution, mm-hmm. you know, that yeah. they're trying to take care of us mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's just, it's like that part deserves love too, you know? 
Yeah. The part that is the, the is and the shame is in its own protection. It's a right. program that's come online for a reason at an earlier stage. And so finding how to actually appreciate that part mm-hmm. and not shame the shamer. Yeah. And I usually like to reference this to think about when that came online. Yeah. Because she, he, they are probably they were tiny. Yeah, little tiny like, baby. Little tiny baby. Yeah. And that little tiny baby thought, ah, oh, this is the right I'm solution. bad. I'm this wrong. Is yeah, this is totally. how I do it. You yeah. know, and it probably worked at one point. Get yeah. the attention and love that they needed to be taken care of. Yeah. But then it's like, hmm, yeah. this is, there's collateral damage to that too. Yeah. So, mm. you know, can we love and hold that little one of us mm-hmm. and recognize, yeah, baby, you were doing the best that yeah. you could. And there's, you actually needed something else yeah. and, and I hear you and I see you and I'm with you. Mm. Let me reparent you. Let me be there with yeah. you and let's help this. <laughs> That's central. Get that, get that resolved. Yeah. yeah. So l- let's answer that question. Like, first of all, can we, right? So I, if you're listening to this and receiving this and any part of this is landing in your system, let's invite to the table, to your seat, to your car, to your bed, wherever you are right now, the younger version of you who bought into any level of misbelief in story that you did anything wrong or were bad, that there was anything wrong with you. And literally like, see if you can locate that aspect of yourself right now and call him, call her forward just to be present in the listening. And so we're asking if we can bring the light of love and forgiveness and acceptance and inclusion to all parts of ourselves. And remember, it's okay for it to not work immediately. It's okay for it to not be okay. The signal that you're sending, that you are interested, that you care, that you're doing your very fucking best. And one thing I know for damn sure is that if you're listening to this and you've gotten this far in this episode, you are doing your very fucking best. So let's start there with that acknowledgement and bring forward the presence of love that is the truth of who you are, that is what brought you here to listening to this right now and offer some of that love up to the part of you that didn't think that she deserved it or he deserved it. And if that part isn't ready to receive it yet, that's okay. It's about the intention. It's about the aim. So let's take a deep breath right there into that. So where I want to go is, you know, a conversation around inclusion. So, you know, I brought forward um, within ourselves this piece around including the part of yourself that um, you may have deemed unlovable, you know, that part that um, either shames or is being shamed, right? The part of you that at a deep, deep level has believed, I don't belong, I've done something wrong, I'm not worthy you know, these, these core insidious, um, wounded misbeliefs that many, many, most, I uh, could even say most of us carry on one level or another. And I noticed that, um, you know, this, uh, conversation around sisterhood is huge for both of us mm-hmm. in the work that we do with undone, like the inclusivity mm-hmm. that you invite through undone for these women of all parts of themselves, which of course includes of each other in all parts of each other. Mm -hmm. But first it has to start with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the same with me in the dojo ecosystem, the stand that I take for sisterhood and a sisterhood that is transcendent of every container that I facilitate and really holding that as true. In order to do that, we've both been on a journey within ourselves, I imagine, around inclusion, right? So first we start with ourselves. And what I've noticed within myself around belonging and inclusion is that from an earlier stage, there was a wound around feeling unconditionally loved, right? Like knowing that I belong unconditionally and that I won't be abandoned. So the abandonment wound and what I've learned about myself and seen manifest itself in many of my clients is that when often when there's a deep abandonment wound there, it then translates into, of course, a fear of abandonment. And so when we're carrying this fear of abandonment throughout our lives, that then becomes the edge. And often the protection mechanism that we develop is, will have us abandon ourselves in an effort to try to not get abandoned. 
So when we're in relationship, when we're in friendship, in, in community, in romantic partnership, I noticed in myself earlier on a deep pattern of people pleasing, bending over backwards, abandoning myself, saying what I think other people, you employing my empathy to say what I think other people want to hear so that they will love me, even though it's me not loving me by doing that. It's me putting myself second so that they won't put me second. It's me not including myself so that I can try to be included, right? So that that pattern would really reveal itself a lot in the earlier, in my earlier stages of my awakening and still comes up at times where I can see it. And it's ironic because the way that I personally have moved through it is by actually having to embrace the willingness to be abandoned. I've had to intentionally, this is the edge, right? Cross the threshold within myself of being willing to feel the feeling of abandonment. It doesn't mean that I will be abandoned. It means that I've made a conscious practice of it, be, of, of being willing to feel the feeling of rejection, feel the feeling of abandonment, right? Being, being willing to actually permeate that within myself because what occurred is the feeling of abandoning myself, the feeling of betraying myself actually became finally more uncomfortable than it felt to risk feeling the feeling of someone else abandoning me. So by increasing my threshold of tolerance, mm -hmm. right, which is Kat alluded to earlier, right? I had to increase my threshold of tolerance for the feeling of abandonment as a possibility, as a possibility. By doing that, I created space within myself to say the thing that someone else might not want to hear to honor myself above all else. And that is an act of loving myself, of not abandoning myself. And ironically, the more myself I became and the more inclusive I became of all parts of myself, the more I stand for myself that I became, the more I saw that reflected in my relationships. Ironically, the more a stand others took for me, the more included I felt, the more loved unconditionally I felt because I was loving myself and holding myself in that way. So that's part of the journey that I've been on, on the inner landscape around belonging and inclusivity. And I want to talk about it. I want to start with us and then kind of go out into the larger picture, right? So I'm curious of your own journey in sisterhood and belonging or family, however it's occurred for you, how you've come home to yourself and, and what that journey has been like for you. Oof. Uh, I mean, you put it so succinctly. I'm like, how do I put it so succinctly? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're, you're um, great with words. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, the, uh, I'll, I'll make this a collective experience because I, I, I recognize that my experience is, is everyone's experience yeah. as well, you know, are very similar. Um, but the, this idea around being included mm -hmm. in groups, you know, especially, mm -hmm you know, where we here now yeah. is a very young part of us. Mm -hmm. So it was, in, it was crucial for us to belong in groups, yeah. especially as children, yeah. belong with our peers. We needed to belong with our family. Mm -hmm. And so how we, how we got to belong um, this, the clever solutions we would come up with to belong to those groups. Yeah. I, I hear this so many times with my students of like, you know, you see the group of friends in, or the, the group of peers in your mm -hmm. classroom and they're yeah. that group over there, that group's having fun. Yeah. That group, I want that. Yeah. I want that. I yeah. want what they have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at that and then we can, we, we go inside and we're like, okay, how do I get that? Mm -hmm. And whether we're conscious of this or not, we're strategizing of how to be able to get those things. Mm -hmm. How do I belong? Yeah. That's like a core basic human need because yeah. we need to survive in this world. Yeah. And I can recall many times when I was younger, you know, if, okay, how of strategizing and saying, okay, that girl is really adorable. So yeah. they go to her, she's adorable. And so part of that imprinted of like, okay, you look really cute. Mm -hmm. That's how you get love. Yeah. Right. And love like, uh, as a child, our only job is to get love. Yeah. Because if we get love, that ensures we're taken care of. Mm -hmm. And so that that uh, supports our survival. 
And mm -hmm. so we're picking up and we're trying out these things. We're spitting out these different solutions, seeing what works, what gets us that attention, what mm -hmm. gets us our needs met, yeah. what gets us that love. Yeah. Similar with the, with the peers. Mm -hmm. Starts with family, also contributed with the peers. Mm -hmm. You know, so how many of us, myself included, were bullied at one time or the other, mm -hmm. you know, and how that... Uh, the pain of rejection we viscerally feel in the nervous system, mm -hmm. the loss of connection we viscerally feel in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So we will do whatever we can, mm -hmm. especially at that age, mm -hmm. to prevent that pain. Yeah. And so we we gather up these solutions, we put it in our toolbox, yeah. and then we carry it through life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? We got a little <laughs> toolbox there. What we got? Yeah. What we got? And yeah. we tend to default to the same solutions over and yeah. over and over again. Yeah. So for me, <laughs> you know, growing into uh, grade school, high school, college, one of my tools was eating disorder. Mm. And I got real good at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> real good at yeah. it. To manage what I thought were emotions that weren't socially acceptable, feelings that I had that I didn't think would would result in love, yeah. you know, physical looks and contraction control to mm -hmm. be what I need, what I thought people needed. Yeah. And uh, the tool of uh, hypersensitivity. I was mm -hmm. very sensitive to the needs and mm -hmm. be able to anticipate the needs of other people. Mm -hmm. I got real good at that. Yeah. And as a result of that, I wasn't connected at mm -hmm. all with the internal experience of myself. Mm -hmm. And so my body ended up, you know, fighting me with that. A lot yeah. of autoimmune um, challenges and mm. inflammation and, and mm. um, uh, stomach aches. I would have stomach aches for years, you know, and mm -hmm. just all of these of my body pretty much yelling at me and saying, you're not listening to me. Yeah. You know, what's actually authentic to mm -hmm. what's going on here. Wow. And so yeah. as adults, let's look at our friendships. And I get that um, culturally friendships and how they form is different everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, some cultures, um, and especially around here in LA, there's a lot more community. Mm -hmm. um, and other places, parts of the world, I'm from rural town, Missouri. We're both... We're, We're both, both from, from the St. same Louis. place. Yeah. yeah. Pretty sure we like keep following each other. Yeah. Into lifetime to lifetime, yeah. city to city, birthplace to birthplace. Literally, this is our life. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, in Missouri, you know, it's not so much community. Mm -hmm. It's like you have a small group of friends, maybe yeah. like a few friends. And that's mm -hmm. that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. I know that there are communities in Missouri. I'm not saying that there's not. But yeah. like the norm was like mm -hmm. you have your little posse. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this or no friends at all, or like mm. one friend, you know, that, yeah. like uh, taking into consideration the entire world and not just our lives, but there's, um, can bring up these feelings around not being included or not, mm -hmm. not being invited when everybody else was. And I definitely yeah. have those experiences, but this yeah. is a young part of us. Yeah. We have to keep coming back to that. Mm -hmm. This is a young part of me where that was more of an emphasis and more necessary. Yeah. Now as an adult, mm -hmm. with my wisdom, with my yeah. insights and with my skills, yeah. can I be with yeah. that, yeah. that I'm not included in everything? And mm -hmm. can I instead focus my attention on the quality of individual relationships? Yeah. Because group think mm -hmm. is a young mentality. Mm -hmm. So your younger self is coming up when they're making decisions based on what's the group, what's going to make sure that I'm included yeah. or what's the group doing? Mm -hmm. What, uh, where are they traveling to? Where are they yeah. going tonight? What are they yeah. doing? Yeah. Instead of tuning into the self discernment mm -hmm. of what do I need? Yeah. Yeah. The whole group is going out to, yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't know, Costa Rica. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, tuning into myself and my nervous system, mm -hmm. I'm getting the flow, the, the some stress coming up. Yeah. That's actually not going to be what's what I need. Yeah. So but, powerful. Yeah, yeah, but the the no is coming from the self yeah. preservation versus the the yes would have been a group mm -hmm. preservation. Yeah. That would have been self abandoning. Yeah. Yeah. Super powerful. Super yeah. powerful. Yeah, it's like the um, and the technology, I, I'm, I'm, I'm referencing this now as a technology and that which I'm referencing is trust. Trust becomes an empowerment technology when we can employ it effectively. And so I feel like, you know, 
part of the turning point for me and the, the, what you're referencing of shifting from group think and prioritizing what's the group doing and the need to be included, which is coming from a lack that was bought into from a child consciousness innocently because sure. survival is based on being yeah, included in the core family, right? So we like that. We want that. But the child actual survival with the roof over your head and the food that you're eating was dependent on right? Being included. The turning point for me in many ways was recognizing that trusting myself first. So the self-empowerment of trusting myself, feeling in your body, attuning to your body, trusting the message and the wisdom of your body could then allow me to trust the, the core truth of my relationships. So the individual relationships within the group and being in trust is actually magnetic within itself. I feel like when you're, when you're in self trust and then you're also gifting trust to the relationships that are most prominent in your life, which is the idea that you, you know, when, when we can die into the timeline of not being included in everything or not being present for every event or every experience and choose, often we have to choose it at first, choose to deploy our trust in service of the relationships that are the most important to us, which means that I trust that the love I have with this person and that person and these members of the community that I feel the closest with is so beyond my presence at any individual experience or event or group gathering. It actually, I feel like adds empowerment to the relationship itself. It, it removes the, the idea, the lack from it. It removes, removes the idea that I need to try or prove or effort to preserve this particular dynamic or this particular relationship, which actually makes it even more sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we, we do need to break down what trust is though, Let's too, because that's also a complex terminology. And yeah. some of us, well, I don't know. If, like, well, how do I do that? Look, do I yeah. trust myself? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Uh, but like trust is a gathering of, of evidence and information, you mm -hmm. know, we, we, um, evidence and information that you can take care of yourself, yeah. that you will be okay on the other side mm -hmm. because there's a part in you and that's the part of you that's criticizing or the part of you that's afraid is not sure that you're going to be able to handle it. That's right. And so part of it, like gathering the wisdom that you're talking about, um, gathering insights, um, trying things out and gaining the new reference points that, mm -hmm. okay, like that was doing, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was okay. I actually mm -hmm. survived and more mm -hmm. than survived. I thrived totally. And okay. Well, maybe that one was a little wonky, but we got through it, yeah. you know, and I didn't have to keep defaulting to the eating disorder or the, the incessant texting or that whatever yeah. Yeah. tools we were using, yeah, totally. you know, and, and on the other side of that, mm -hmm. it, it adds to your landscape in your yeah. mind of like, oh, I do have the wisdom, the insights, the skills to take care of myself. Yeah. No, I'm not that younger version yeah. of myself. Speaking of the, creating a new reference point, there's often an old reference point of a time that we were perhaps less, less evolved or the people in our lives were less evolved. And it's like the mean girl phenomenon, right? So if we have an old reference point from high school or grade school or college where we we actually were left out or not included. And it created a, a really big impact in the body, the nervous system and pinged the part of us that was believing we don't belong or there's something wrong with us. And it really was impactful and painful. Often there's a, there's a, an energy within us that just wants to do anything to not feel that again. And so that's what will have us go into these preservative patterns, these proving patterns. And so giving often the first, the first moment where the shift is made, where we come out of proving, trying, preserving, efforting, um, to, to, or any of the tools cats mentioning that we had from back back in the day to try to make sure that we're included or belong. When we actually let go of those for the first time, I just want to name that it can feel really fucking scary. Mm -hmm. And we may actualize in our life an experience of act of not being included, because if there's a resistance to that often, right. As a creator, we recognize that will may be a part of our curriculum to manifest an experience in our life where the people that we care about the most don't include us for something, right? Whatever it looks like. And I just want to name that in that moment, 
it fucking hurts. And it it is really uncomfortable and feels really scary. And that's valid. And that's, that's valid. valid. And then we have the choice point. So this is what I want to illuminate here and what Kat and I are inviting you into is that when that happens, we recognize, okay, I'm not a victim. This is a part of my soul curriculum to manifest the experience of feeling like I don't belong. Like right now I'm feeling like I don't belong. And what's coming up for me is that is the fear that something's wrong with me and that I'll get left behind or whatever it is for you. Right? So then we sit in that moment and we can just with that little amount of space of recognizing I have drawn this into my field and it makes sense that this is coming up for me. If I didn't have the sensitivity around it evolu- from an evolutionary perspective, I, there'd be no real need for me to draw it into my space. And I'm speaking from cre- the lens of creator consciousness, which I feel is the most empowered place to come from. And that's where we're always going to invite you in the dojo in the dojo experience and the dojo ecosystem. So in that moment, and let's all just call it, call forward a recollection of when the, the first moment that that occurred or the, or the most recent time that you felt that I don't belong or I'm not being included. In that moment, we have a choice. If you can create enough space around it to not go into immediate reactivity into your normal survival patterns, because you will go into a survival response because it was, it felt life or death as a child. And in the earlier years, it felt like if my family, if I'm not included, then I'm going to be left for the saber tooth tigers, right? On a primal instinctual level, that's the way our body memory is, is housing it. So when we have space around it, we have the choice point in this moment, I could either be the version of myself that is in the action of trying to survive from the experience of the per- perception of not belonging, or I can employ some of the nervous system regulation techniques that Kat mentioned earlier, breathing deeply, engaging with the senses, getting, bringing my presence into the environment, shaking, even looking in the mirror. I remember when Kat, when you came and supported me in that big breakup moment with my past partner, it was coming into regulation with your, with eye contact, like nervous system co-regulation with someone else, but finding, prioritizing, regulating your nervous system and finding home within yourself again. And then from that place, there's an opportunity to choose into a new and more empowered timeline where we're not in reaching or desperate or fear-based survival patterns to try to be included, but we're employing the new timeline, which comes from trust, trust. So that's where we can talk about trust. So how can I, in this moment from giving myself the space to regulate myself as fully as possible, what is, what does it look like for me now to trust myself to give myself the energy of acknowledgement, affirmation, and belonging. For me, knowing my own heart has been really powerful. So coming home to my heart and affirming in the mirror with myself, who it is I know myself to be, where it is I know myself to be coming from, the inherent goodness and innocence of my own heart, and really creating the space for me to receive that within myself, which eliminates the need to receive it from someone else. And I want to build into this that compassion is really important. So you can, if you go into the old pattern 10 more times, 50 more times, once you become aware that there's another door, that's okay. Just every time you do it, you become more aware that I'm okay. I'm doing this and it's coming from fear. So I'm going to give myself compassion right here and say that it's okay. And the more okay it becomes, the more space there is to actually walk through the new door. So when those moments come, we get to walk through the new door and give ourselves what it is that we would receive from the experience of inclusion or the safety of that, you know, the safety of it. So where can we create safety? Where could we each create safety through the new door? So that's where I feel like we can employ. We start to build a new reference point for what it feels like to trust ourselves. When every time you do that, every time you create space and a new behavior pattern and walk through the new door, empower yourself in that way, it builds trust. It builds trust. So can you think of any times where you've built trust for yourself in that way through the new door, whether it's 
through the conversation around belonging or through, you know, intimacy, like where there was edges. And then you found that choice point where there was a choice point to go into an old survival pattern, like where your nervous system was becoming dysregulated. It could be in an intimate exchange or relational exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I want to tie this back to the work that I do because this is my why, um, Mm -hmm. sexuality. Yeah. You know, there is so much more conversation being had around sexuality, Mm -hmm. luckily. And, and you, you even heard in my, in the way that I speak, I speak inclusively. Yeah. Women, non-binary, trans Mm -hmm. men, it, it, it's, there's so many people out there who don't feel seen yeah. and don't feel included. Can I join that women's circle, even though I don't identify as a woman? Yeah. You know, and so from my own journey around sexuality and discovering who I am um, and who I like mm-hmm. has been its own process. And it's in we all have our own solo journey, like all of our spiritual journeys are essentially a solo journey. And especially for me coming from Missouri, where, you know, none of this sexuality stuff was accessible, except, you know, um, going to a a Catholic high school, you know, and so everything is a lot more limited. But um, coming out to L.A. and observing and getting reference points of different types of relating, and that's where I got to explore Um, my attraction with women when I was Mm -hmm. 24, you know, and, and getting to go into these edges around Tantra and BDSM and, and, um, relating Mm non-traditionally. And I Mm -hmm. didn't have many people around me. So it was a lot of me leading the way Mm -hmm. and just gaining the reference points of, of I'm okay on the other side of all of this experimentation. Right. And And that isn't to say that that protected me from the projections of other people and my friends Mm -hmm. who told me that, you know, along the way of telling me that um, me having different lovers was not, it it was not evolved or it wasn't, you know, I couldn't call in a partner if I was with multiple people at the, you know, at that moment Mm -hmm. or um, you know, different people will put their own truth with a capital T on you. Yeah. And it's so important for us to discern for ourselves what our truth is and what a, what is our yes and our no's and yeah. and and ex- allow ourselves to experiment, to discover on the other side of experiments of, well, okay, that one doesn't work out or that's, it. <laughs> that's not what I want. <laughs> yeah. You know? and, yeah. be, and letting that be a part of the, the, um, mm-hmm. mm, divinely perfect unfolding of your life and it's not that it's going to be without pain it's going to be you know there's going to be that and i'm even uh, speaking more uh on the platform of of integrating tantric and sacred sexuality with bdsm Mm -hmm. and seeing a lot of uh responses in social media Mm -hmm. or in communities Mm -hmm. around what i speak about some of them are are praising it. And some people it's, you know, I I'm receiving a lot of projections that are from uh, a misunderstanding and an ignorance and not to um, say that there's anything wrong with that person. And so because I have Mm. the trust in myself and and, and the competency Mm. and the confidence around what I know, Mm -hmm. what I experience in my own body and what I've been able to witness in other people crack wide open is uh, being able to have these conversations with gentleness, mm, mm-hmm. gentleness, and mm-hmm. knowing that the their reactions and their not knowing, yeah, is okay and welcome, yeah, and mm. it ha- and it's valid, given all the misunderstandings, the miseducations, mm-hmm. the misrepresentations in mm-hmm. our culture mm-hmm. around marginalized communities and expressions and identities yeah you know there's a lot we still are working on as conversations like these that we get to have Mm -hmm. and and to uh educate Mm -hmm. you know accurately yeah and be inclusive yeah (laughs) in just the way that we talk yeah so that people other people gain reference points now Mm -hmm. they can either take that information Mm -hmm. and and the the responses I get from people is yeah. oftentimes grateful of, yeah. thank you for being gentle back with me, yeah. you know, and, totally. and, um, and they don't, they may or may not, you know, 
take what I mm-hmm. what I say, and that's okay. Yeah, because they have their own upbringing, their own reference points, their own, mm-hmm. and and it's still. Um, I know that I'm doing what I can with the medicine that I, you know, I still trust myself of, okay, their response isn't anything about me. It's a product of the, uh, the cultural wounding, the patriarchy, the, you know, all these, these, uh, cultural traumas that we're working through yeah, uh, or personal traumas that we're working through too. And that's okay. Mm. So powerful. So yeah, what I'm hearing and in, in what you're sharing is that there's been a whole initiation for you yeah. around really stepping forward into yeah. the 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 work that you do as a sexual educator, as a tantric facilitator, mm-hmm. as a um, you know psychotherapist that's also integrating plant medicine. Yeah. Right. So you're very yeah. much a, <laughs> you're a whole very, very much a bridger. Yeah. Very much mm-hmm. a bridger. Yeah. And that you have had the opportunity to really meet your own edge yeah. and actually face off with and and like integrate yeah. the fe- the fear of feeling judgment and rejection from those who might not share the same belief systems yeah. as you. And that is what gives you the space to like actually um invite others to expand beyond their own edges because you're, you've learned how to be with yourself on the other side of your own, Yeah, you know, and that's huge. So I'm curious, are there any, um, just to like ground it in, are there any more like tangible examples that you could give us? Like you shared, you said for a moment, like there's been, you know, exper- like experimentations that you've gone into. Cause I want to encourage our audience to experiment and to find your edges in the zones that we're describing and zones that we aren't. And so I'd love, um, if you could, if you'd be open mm-hmm. to sharing, you said, you know, I've experimented and like, it didn't work out. And then mm-hmm. I was met yeah. myself right there. Yeah. So is there like more of a practical example of an, ex- like an experimentation that you went into with yourself or with a partner where it was like, wow, well, that didn't go the way that I thought. And then it was met with either judgment or you find yourself there on the pulse of the other side of that. Whoa. And then what, how did you be with yourself right there? Like, what did that look like? Yeah. Yeah. I'll give an example of, uh, in one of my tantric immersions years ago, um, they, we were doing a practice where we were lying on the floor and we were practicing moving energy through, through our partner. And so I was paired with this, with this man that I already felt, um, really uncomfortable around. Mm -hmm. And so as the practice began and I gave the boundaries around, you know, not uh, no genital touch and, and, um, uh, I can't recall exactly what it was, but I I gave the boundaries Mm -hmm. and then we, then we began and he started moving through me because I'm very very in tune to energy. He started moving through me sexual energy. Mm-hmm. And as I'm laying there, I started to panic. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is really uncomfortable. I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like yeah. this. And then I started telling myself, because I have experiences of uh, being raped and sexual mm-hmm. violations and, mm-hmm. and uh, this. And so I was in my head and I was like, okay, you're here now, you're here in this space, you're not there, you, that was then, this is now, mm-hmm. you know, you're okay, you're safe. And I'm in my head having this process. And then after the experience, I started talking to him about it. Yeah. And he went into a defense mode and started mm-hmm. defending himself. Mm-hmm. And I just short circuited and I was like, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. and, and then I brought it forward to the group, mm-hmm. you know, they, they asked us to share and I, yeah. and I did. And I, uh, described my experience and I described how I, the solution of how I was trying to take care of myself yeah. in that, in that experience. Mm-hmm. And the facilitator interrupted me and she goes, so you allowed touch that you didn't want. Mm. And I go, well, I knew that this was a trauma mm-hmm. and I knew that. And she goes, so you allowed touch that you didn't Mm. and I just started falling (sighs) because we think that you know by doing the these things yes that is a solution to to titrate between back then and now and back then and now but if it doesn't feel good and you're allowing it to continue Mm -hmm. that is only perpetuating Mm. the betrayal in your own body 
Mm. But if wow. we allow ourselves mm -hmm. along our journey of experimentation, not to do experiments that we deem we're supposed to do, or that would be the next step of our evolution, yeah. you know, just for the sake yeah. of that, or because yeah. other people are doing it. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are trying non-traditional relationships yeah. because they think that's the more evolved step mm -hmm. and it's not mm. if it doesn't feel good for mm -hmm. you yeah and that's important mm -hmm. and there's a difference between your edge and your boundary yeah and learning the difference between the textures of those pieces wow. an edge yeah. is something that you can lean into it might be uncomfortable mm -hmm. but it's not self-sacrificing yeah a boundary is a limit of your availability for mm -hmm. whatever it is yeah. and for whatever reason. Yeah. It, it's it we're dynamic, so it changes. But if you cross that or step on that boundary, you will feel a violation, a yeah. self violation. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Really, really well said. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's really important information to um, integrate as we navigate, especially in you know the this particular ecosystem in, in the intention of expanding beyond our edges, which is not to violate yourself and abandon yourself and stretch beyond an, a true essence boundary. I think, you know, this is a good entry point. And, you know, as we start to land the ship of this episode, I would like to, you know, just touch on, you know, the, your experience between, you know, open relationships, polyamory, monogamy and the whole spectrum, you know, yeah. of the, within that, because, you know, as you shared, um, your, your story, it, it reminded me of an experience that I had also in a, um, I won't name it, but a, a tantric container retreat container mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I would say the majority of the, the people present there, including the facilitators were oriented more towards, um, polyamory and open relating and that it has not um that's hasn't been my um, orientation i'm oriented towards devotion and monogamy and also i'll say my stretch zone isn't necessarily further in the direction of commitment loyalty and devotion because i'm really fucking great at that but my stretch zone is actually in the direction of um deeper trust and and breathing freedom into the depths of devotion and um you know you know being open to um having experiences of intimacy with my partner that are within the the, the boundaries that are true to my essence you know so how has your experience been um, with this and, oh, and I will say in that container I was in, I felt like the space wasn't there necessarily to be fully inclusive of me. It almost felt like, um, there was something like, like I, it brought up the feeling of me, like, is it, is it off or wrong or like bad that I'm not wired in this way of like more poly or open relating? Because that is at least as far as I've experienced so far, hasn't been the essence of where I come of where my essence comes from. Right. So I'm willing to stretch within my integrity zone, but, um, in that container, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel that my orientation was held. It yeah. was like, almost like there was like a little bit of confusion or shame. Like, I, I don't know if I'd go as far as shame coming up. Cause I really stood at my boundaries yeah. and like held myself in that, yeah. but I didn't feel like what you just said really landed. Yeah. So I didn't feel that. And so I'm curious how you orient. Cause I know you work mm -hmm. with the full spectrum from fully monogamous mm -hmm. to totally polyamorous. Yeah. And so, yeah. How is that? How do you orient within all of it, within the people that you work with and help everyone feel included? Yeah. 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 So along my journey, um, it started out because I was, you know, studying sex therapy and I was oh so curious. I was, it was a yes. I was yeah. like, I really want to try this relationship. It yeah. was like, this feels right. Right. And especially because it allowed me more of the fluidity of my, um, attractions to, to a plethora of, yeah. of gender expressions. So, so having a partner who was also a this feels good. I want to yeah. explore this too. Helped, right? Mm -hmm. So we were both on that um, very authentic yes yeah. experience. And mm -hmm. that's that's a challenging point for many relationships because yeah. some 
times somebody wants it and then somebody doesn't and then they self-sacrifice in order to do it. Yeah. And so sometimes there's that. And then along that way, that particular relationship, getting to observe how much work I was putting in to make these these types of relationships work and how much my partner or my lovers were taking in yeah. um, consideration and work for. And so as you're exploring, if you choose to explore that, like these are information for you to put in your jar of trust or put in your jar of discernment of mm-hmm. whether this this is something that you want to do or not. Um, it, uh, I don't believe that there's any one style of relationship that's more evolved than the other. Mm-hmm. What I do believe is the discernment is the more evolved uh, element that or lesson yeah. that we can gain from that. Mm-hmm. Like this, you know, try there's um, okay, so styles of relationships. I mean, really, you can make any type of relationship along the spectrum of anything. Like yeah, <laughs> the yeah. potential of relationship it's just vast, as, is yeah. is infinite, just mm-hmm. as much as it is with any other human condition. But we like to put labels on to help categorize and help us to better communicate and understand. Mm-hmm. Um, but even how we might relate at one point might change given the dynamic nature of who we are, the dynamic nature of our lifestyles, what yeah. we're available, what we can do. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I've personally come to realize yeah. as I was identifying as these different styles of relationships, mm-hmm. but realizing that me and the alchemy with another person and me and this the availability that I have with my career yeah. and me and the availability of my health, all of these contextual factors contribute to how I'm going to relate in that Mm, moment. I love that. So freeing myself from those labels actually helped me to start creating the most authentic relationship for me at Mm. that time. There are, and I will say that there are these different uh, categories that help people to, to start somewhere, Yeah, you know, and, and um, give them role models and reference points. And I think that's, the tool of labels oh. uh, that we can the the the, uh, the benefit of them yeah so mm. somebody who is monogamous uh, the schema around that or the image that we get around that is yeah. somebody who it traditionally we see somebody who is uh, relating sexually and emotionally with one person. Mm-hmm. Right. They have friends that they might yeah. be emotionally connected with, but this is their safe haven. This mm-hmm. is their go to person. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have monogamish mm-hmm. and that is couples who are together as a committed relationship. Mm-hmm. But then they might blur the lines. Maybe mm-hmm. they flirt with other people. Maybe mm-hmm. they make out with other people. Mm-hmm. Maybe they they. They are playful with other people, mm-hmm. uh, but they, they are their primary person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then a uh, step beyond that would be um, probably open. Mm-hmm. Open would be, okay, our relationship isn't confined to just the boundaries of us. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a, an opportunity to date other people or mm-hmm. maybe make out with other people or maybe have sex with other people, but it's Mm -hmm. not, um, we, it's us, Mm -hmm. us, and then potential of other people. Mm -hmm. Maybe we share people together. Mm -hmm. Maybe we share people, uh, or experience other people separately, Mm -hmm. but that's defined with that, with that unit. Yeah. And then there's swingers and swingers Mm -hmm. is a community of people who share partners. Mm. So they are partnered Uh typically yeah. But then they share partners. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's, there's typically this is seen in a space, like mm-hmm. a shared space of mm-hmm. sharing partners, or mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be, it can also be partner swapping. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, we share each other's partners. Yeah. Right? And then beyond that, we have, we step into more polyamory, which mm-hmm. is um, the ability to be in love with more than one person. Mm-hmm. So the love aspect of it is what makes it more unique than some of the others. Mm-hmm. There's this ability of um, having more than one partner, mm-hmm. um, having girlfriends mm-hmm. and a partner. Some people have a hierarchy where they have like a primary person and then they have girlfriends or boyfriends or, or mm-hmm. whoever. And then some uh, some situations have 
no hierarchy and everybody's equal ground. Got it. And then in some situations, it's uh, anarchy. So it's just just me as a solo person, but I can be with whomever I mm-hmm. want to, and you can be with whomever you want to. Mm-hmm. So mm. in, in broad all spectrum. of this, broad, <laughs> yes, spectrum, broad spectrum, broad spectrum, yeah. and, and it's all and fluid between all of it, between any of those categories, and it I'm can sure. Be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And depending on the context and what we need and who this person is, mm-hmm. you know, and and if we allow ourselves that permission to do that, yeah. we allow ourselves the agency of, and ourselves and the other people involved, mm-hmm. the agency mm-hmm. to, to do that. Yeah. So honesty, consent, agency are all three important elements that make the success yeah. of these happen. Super powerful. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I don't, I don't know that I've ever received it laid out like yeah. that in a way with such what I love about your transmission. It's such an unbiased transmission. Mm. You gave just as much love to the monogamous container as you gave to the anar- <laughs> anarchist container, yeah. right? You like fully, I really feel that embodied in you and that's mm. fucking gorgeous. So thank you for what you're carrying and what you're holding. And that is what creates the space I feel for deeper trust and exploration in the, in the container of clients that you hold, Mm, you know, because there's not a overlay of your own judgment on it. It's really inclusive of everyone within the entire spectrum. So there's, there's room to grow and, you know, experiment within that, which is so amazing. Um, and I feel, um, you know, as you're, as you're sharing that, you know, there's this energy of discernment that you're bringing forward. And I feel like one, one shadow of someone like me, who's wired more towards monogamy, but there's also, you know, an openness that comes from the recognition that life is life and we get to trust life. And that I always want to stand for the most empowered, liberated expression of my partner and of myself in the same way he stands for the most liberated expression of me and for himself, you know? So the devotion to that, I feel like is a beautiful place that, that true discernment can come from because it's inclusive of the unit, you know? So in a relationship, I feel like, um, you know, the shadow I was going for the, this, I can feel one shadow in someone like myself, I guess I can only really speak for myself and the monogamous, like more monogamously oriented, mm-hmm. still with an openness to trust life is that the, the shadow can look like a closure or like a, creating a closed circuit, right. That, that comes from control or fear. And I feel like that is like relaxing that, um, in relationship into the depth of trust of the unit mm-hmm. so that there's space for the two of you to experience the, the magic of life together and just tracking, um, if there's any energy of control or lack that's or manipulation that's coming from a fear that actually creates a closure in the unit so that the unit itself isn't even available to have the opportunity to discern. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like there's so that's where I feel a, an expanse in within myself is actually relaxing into the trust of the unit and and allowing there to be a a deeper trust in the discernment of us, yeah. which allows a true allegiance to life and for us to explore life together. Mm-hmm. And so you can be in the in the monogamous commitment with an openness to trust life together and whatever that brings. You know what I mean? And so I'm sure there's variations and iterations of that in every one of those nodules that you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So the same in the other, and the extreme, the other side of the spectrum of like total either anarchy or polyamory, perhaps there's an opportunity to lean into the edge of, okay, what does, when the, if a, if a person comes in that inspires it, trusting life is actually not being fixed on the identity of, I am this, you know, polyamorous, or I am this, but I can actually relax into the trust of the unit or trust of life, trust of myself and open to, okay. And if my discernment says otherwise at any point, I'm willing to go deeper in the direction of, you know, open or monogamy or, you know, so this, this energy of discernment, I think is really important. And the discernment, it, it gets, ideally it gets to come from true trust yeah. in in the bigger what's here-ness of the moment. Yeah. And thank you for painting that mm. picture of the of an arc there that I think we can all relate to ourselves somewhere on that spectrum and then play from there. 
Yeah. Wow. What a transmission mm-hmm. this was. There. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot in there. I'm, I'm going to have to listen to that <laughs> journey again. And Kat, Kat, thank you so much for saying yes and for showing up for this, for, for this transmission together, for this sisterhood, for all the, you're, you're one of the most incredible friends that I know, just not only in how you show up as a friend to me, but how I witness you show up as a friend and a sister and an ally Mm -hmm. to everyone in your life who you choose, who you choose to show up for. It's such a gift to be present as a sister in your life. Mm -hmm. So I would love to invite you to share just how anyone listening can find you, how they can go deeper with you, any containers you have available. Um, so yeah, so they they can find you. Yes. So everybody can find me on sexloveyoga.com. That's my hub where you can find all of my online programs around sensuality, around eroticism. Mm -hmm. I have an upcoming container, six week container for femme, women, non-binary to um, access their eroticism Mm -hmm. coming up in April. Mm -hmm. Um, I also am running retreats and, and holding group spaces for ketamine and sex therapy Mm -hmm. for couples. And (laughs) yeah, she's the coolest. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they can find, also find my podcast, eat, play sex, Mm -hmm. um, which is expert oriented all about sex. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My favorite topic. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here. So grateful for you. And with that, we are going to close out this container. I want to really honor you for the courage that it takes to live your life beyond the edge right along with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for creating this space to receive this transmission and for having the courage that it takes to live your life beyond the edge. If you feel the call to go deeper with me privately or explore the dojo ecosystem, the best place to start is by visiting zaharazimring.com and taking your free micro dojo. You can also find me on Instagram at Zahara Zimring, and I love hearing from you guys. So feel free to send me messages, make comments, and I will absolutely get back to you. I also would deeply appreciate if this episode or any of these episodes have touched your heart, leave a review as it really supports this show in touching more hearts and more lives all around the world. Thank you for joining and I'll see you next time.